Welcome back to Old School Sports and our Out of the Park Baseball 24 playthrough of the Buffalo Wings. And the 2036 offseason has begun and our Buffalo Wings, for the second time in 11 Major League seasons, are world champions. Second time in the past three seasons, uh, most importantly. So uh, after a disappointing finish in the playoffs last year when we lost the last two games at home to get knocked out by the Colorado Rockies four games to three in the NLCS. We got the job done right this season uh, beating the Las Vegas A's four games to two to take the World Series and we won game six at home to give the fans in Buffalo something to celebrate. So pleased that uh, we completed what is our goal every season uh, this time around. That is uh, nice when that happens. As I mentioned, um, we've now got two of the last three World Series titles, uh, have made the playoffs nine consecutive years with our Buffalo Wings, so it has been a pretty good run for us here in Buffalo. Uh, with that being said, though, it is time to start thinking about the off season. And the best way for us to think about the off season is to uh, look at what we did this year and uh, then look at the players that delivered that performance for us. And uh, we had an excellent season. The 94 and 68 record uh, was tied for the best in the National League, which after having the best record in baseball three straight years was a bit of a disappointment. Uh, that said, our Pythagorean record was eight games better than we actually performed. We ended up having the second best offense in the National League. And you can see we were in the top uh, two or three in just about every batting category. Uh, the exceptions being home runs where we were sixth, walks where we were fourth, and strikeouts where we were fourth. Led the league in steals. Thank you, Deshaun Seifu and also had a good base running team. And we combined that excellent offense with an outstanding pitching staff, first in the National League in runs allowed, and uh, very similar to our batting rankings in the top handful of uh, the National League in every pitching category, uh, the one exception being strikeouts where we were sixth. Defensive efficiency, we were a very good team. Zone rating, we were a very average team. But the uh, numbers don't lie, and our Buffalo Wings had an excellent season through the 162 regular season games, and then obviously uh, even more so during the postseason. And we'll turn our attention first to taking a look at that excellent pitching staff that we were just talking about. And fortunately for us, we should be able to bring back most of these guys next year. Uh, Alexis Barajas, our ace, is heading into his final arbitration eligible year. He's going to be set to make a lot of money, likely uh, well over $20 million next season. Uh, we are going to want to think about trying to lock him up for the long term after he uh, was very average uh, in the first half season. We had him in Buffalo after we made the big trade with Miami in 2034 to bring him on board. He's pretty much been what we had hoped these last two seasons. As he's got his bearings in Buffalo, uh, was 16-6 and six last year. Uh, even better this year, 17-7 and seven record, 221 strikeouts, a league best 239 ERA, uh, 175 ERA plus, and a 64 fit minus. Um, maybe one of you could explain the math behind this to me. And perhaps I'm showing my naivete, but I would have thought if he has the best ERA in the league, He'd probably have the best ERA plus two, but there must be some uh, some little uh, quirk in how that stat is calculated where there's some kind of factor in there that's not just the pure numbers. Uh, regardless, another excellent Sierra of 2.59 for Barajas and a 6.6 .6 war, which was one of the top figures in the National League. 
Sincere Shazier is our number two starter. Uh, his stuff has never really taken that last step forward that we hoped that it would. He is a good starter, not a great starter. Uh, 13 and 11 this year with a 391 ERA. Uh, his Sierra did creep up to 4.25 this year. Uh, doesn't strike out a ton of batters, but doesn't walk all that many either. And um, has had wars of around three each of the last three seasons. This is a fourth round draft pick from uh, eight years ago at this point who um, surprisingly developed into a frontline starter. He is a guy that we have signed for all of his um, arbitration years and several free agent years. Uh, so he is going to be a member of our pitching staff for years to come. Clearly hope he improves a little bit more from here, but he's young, not even 27. He's durable. He's a fan favorite. Throws in the high 90s. Uh, there's a lot to like about Sincere Shazir, and he'll be back. Juan Estrada, our two-way player, is another guy who we have signed to a medium-term extension. Estrada this year, 12-10 and 10 with a 386 ERA. Uh, he led the National League in ERA a year ago and also, interestingly, didn't have the best ERA plus in the league. So obviously there's uh, something else that goes into that calculation that my aging and lazy brain can't uh, figure out right now. Good, solid year on the mound for him. And Estrada is also a two-way player for us. Um, had an outstanding regular season for us, hit 345 in 333 at bats with 53 runs scored, 35 doubles and 60 ribbies, 145 WRC plus, and put up 3.1 war as a hitter. Uh, by far the best offensive season of his career. Doesn't have much power and he is uh, relatively inefficient on the base paths for whatever reason, and we've tried cutting down his uh, running. Uh, we made that change in the middle of this season when he was incredibly inefficient on the base paths, and he's gotten a little more efficient. But um, 35 doubles and 60 ribbies in 333 at-bats is uh, pretty useful production for us. Uh, so a uh, 5.3 war combined uh, between his pitching and his hitting this year. And Estrada was a, a divisional series MVP for us in our first uh, playoff series victory. Uh, he basically wins a divisional series MVP for us every other year at this point. After a, a very poor performance in the playoffs for us uh, last year, he kind of returned to his uh, customary strong performance this year. Kind of crazy. He has a 0, 177, and 199 ERA in three of his four playoff years. And then last year, that 0-2 record in 13.94 ERA. Uh, but otherwise, he has been a excellent pitcher for us in the postseason. And uh, obviously, that's won him a bit of hardware. Jorge Carrillo is the guy who may not be back next year. International free agent signing from over a decade ago will be 31 years old uh, by opening day. 17 and 6 this past year with a 3.94 ERA, 3.47 Sierra, 2.7 WAR. Um, he's not as good in my mind as the other three guys, but another guy who is popular with the fans an iron man in terms of his injury proneness has a ton of value uh he is adding into free agency though and looking for about 15 and a half million a year with some of the other decisions we're going to have to make most notably with position players we may have to move on from carrillo and our number five starter is the 27 year old isidro ochoa uh seven and 14 this year for an excellent team 457 ERA, 452 Sierra, uh, below average in terms of his ERA plus, um, but a little bit above average in terms of his FIP minus for what that's worth. Um, two and a half war on the season. Our scout still thinks he can get a bit better from here. Uh, he is still going to be making the major league minimum next year. So he will likely 
be back in the mix uh, to be in our rotation. So feel like uh, Baraja, Shazier, Estrada, and Ochoa all definitely going to be back. Uh, so we're going to like four of the five starters we have. Uh, we made a trade for Pat Mems to take over as our closer with Kansas City um, before this past season. He did a uh, solid job for us, uh, well over a strikeout an inning, 277 ERA. Spent some time on the IL for us, so only picked up 23 saves, uh, but was a pretty good player for us. Uh, don't love that he's fragile. Also going to be starting to get expensive. Uh, his arbitration number is going to be about $6.5 million, and we had the Royals retain his whole contract for this past season. Uh, so he will likely be back as our closer um, or a very prominent bullpen role. Uh, but getting close to being fairly priced, that's for sure. Lorne Walborn is our stopper, and uh, he is also arbitration eligible, should be making less than $4 million next year. So we are going to bring him back because all he has done since we brought him over in a big trade with the Dodgers is lead the National League in games and holds every single season while pitching on average 140 plus innings for us. Uh, he was less productive this year in terms of his ERA. His Sierra, however, still really strong, 10.7 strikeouts per nine. Uh, a high volume arm out of our bullpen who's done a nice job for us. Uh, he should be back with us next year. Elvin Jimenez is a guy we uh, picked up in a trade with Baltimore this year. 0-1 uh, with five saves for us, a 2.30 ERA with a strikeout per inning. Uh, he is also arbitration eligible, looking to make about $3 million. Another guy who, when we picked him up, we got his previous team to retain his salary. So uh, we'll have to be paying full freight on him next year. Uh, but with Mems, Walborn, and Jimenez... Um, in the back end of our bullpen for the late innings of games next year. Field will still be in good shape. And Juan Valiz is a guy who we will need to make a decision on because he is finally free agent eligible. Uh, two and three record this year, 264 ERA with 71 strikeouts and 61 and a third innings. Uh, like that he's a left-hander. Um, love to have a couple high-quality lefties in the bullpen in these past few years with Walborn and Valise. We definitely feel that we've had that. He is looking for $9.5 million a year for three years, though. Uh, that is probably getting a bit expensive, um, given that it's materially more than we'll be paying for Mems, Walborn, or Jimenez next year. So may have to move on from Mr. Valise. Mike Waters, a uh, guy who came up through our farm system, ended up being a great 20th round pick in 2033. Uh, 267 ERA over 33 and two thirds innings this year. Uh, doesn't throw incredibly hard. Don't think he's ever going to be a closer for us, uh, but a guy who's making the major league minimum and is certainly a very useful arm out of the bullpen. Speaking of useful arms out of the bullpen, uh, fifth round pick in 2028, Johanne Varejo, headed to arbitration, make about 2.2, 2.3 million most likely, uh, 230 ERA over 62 and two thirds innings. Uh, does not have the greatest control in the world, although he only walked 15 batters this year. Uh, he will be back with us next year, likely playing another prominent role in the bullpen. Hayden Yinger. Uh, is a guy who we have an option on for $1.6 million. He was a starter for us for many years. Um, then he hit free agency, and we brought him back uh, after he briefly departed. Uh, had a nice, solid year for us as a guy out of the pen. Does have a three-pitch arsenal, so he could start in a pinch, although the stamina means he's probably a four- to five-inning guy at best. Uh, but still in a pinch could be useful for us as a spot starter. Uh, likely we'll bring him back at that potential number. Matthew Wenzel has been a lefty for us the past few years. He is finally arbitration eligible, uh, only going to make about a million dollars. Split this year between AAA Albany and the majors in Buffalo, 
and as usual did a respectable job for us although he was slightly below replacement level this year um, he's a guy who um, is definitely better against lefties than he is against righties at the number he's looking for and given the likelihood that we'll need to move on from the lefty Belize I would think that Wenzel will probably be back with us next year and then there's also Cameron Johnson, who we picked up in a trade with the Yankees. Um, he didn't really fill the, dom fill the dominant lefty role that we hoped that he might. Uh, he is headed to free agency. I'm guessing he's going to look more than we want to pay him. Actually, his number is not bad, $1.75 million. Um, I don't love that his movement and his control are both a little before below average. But at that kind of number, um, he may be a guy to consider bringing back. And then we have a couple of other uh, pitchers to mention who uh, were not on our postseason roster but could have a prominent role for us in the not-so-distant future. Uh, one who may not have a prominent role for us is Harleen Susana, who uh, a longtime starter for us has been out of the pen the last couple years. We've got an option for $10 million for him next year. Uh, he was good this year, 88 strikeouts and 78 in a third innings, 276 ERA. But as a guy who's going to be 33 years old before the season, um, unless we're confident that we're going to use him as a number five starter, I can't justify uh, spending $10 million a year on him. At least that's the way I am uh, thinking about it right now. And the reason I'm able to um, think about that a little bit is because we do have some help uh, potentially coming from our farm system to potentially help the rotation, and that's Alexis Mendoza, uh, the number 22 prospect in baseball, fourth round pick uh, four years ago for us. He was five and seven with a 465 ERA this year in Albany, which is not great, but still above average in terms of his ERA plus and FIP minus. Struck out 10.8 per nine innings and hit a 284 Sierra. Uh, so he was a pretty productive pitcher for us and certainly looking at where we think his ratings are right now he could certainly slide into a four or five hole in the bullpen for us uh, at the back in the rotation for us at the back end with Ochoa and likely be a very good replacement for Carrillo and also allow us to perhaps not exercise that 10 million option on Susana the only concern is he's coming off of a torn labrum that he suffered in early July. Uh, so we just have to hope that uh, his ratings and his potential and his profile are pretty similar to what we think they are today uh, when he recovers from that injury, which should be before the holidays. So uh, hopefully we'll know what we're going to uh, potentially have in Mendoza. But right now I would say that he is probably slotted into the four hole where Carrillo is have Ochoa back as our fifth starter and then that likely lets us move on from uh Mr. Susana probably move on from Juan Valiz and then we've got some decisions to make on Yinger and uh whether we would want to bring Johnson back as a lefty out of the bullpen at a uh, number that's a little less than uh I was expecting his number might be So when all is said and done, I think I feel pretty good about where our pitching staff is. Uh, we're potentially going to lose a very good starter in Jorge Carrillo, an excellent left-handed arm in Juan Valiz, a veteran arm who can start or relieve in Susana, and then potentially a Wenzel and or a Johnson or a Yinger we might decide to move on from also. But with the four starters we're bringing back, plus potentially Mr. Mendoza, and then the likes of Mems, Walborn, and Jimenez at the back end of the bullpen, and the likes of Waters and Varejo, and 
possibly some combination of Yinger, Wenzel, and or Johnson coming back in middle and long relief. Feel like the pitching should once again be a strength next year. So I uh, feel like we are in a decent spot to continue having one of the top pitching staffs in the National League. When we turn to our everyday players, though, who provided us, as we talked about, the second highest scoring offense in the National League this past year, this is where uh, we could be losing a fair amount of talent in a best case scenario, and we could be losing an incredible amount of talent if we uh, choose to make certain decisions. Uh, we already talked about the two-way guy, Juan Estrada, and the excellent year that he had for us. Uh, Andres Medina, the excellent defensive catcher, hit 269 with 10 homers and 212 at-bats this year. He was um, in a platoon with Miller much of the year, uh, but we did end up starting Medina every day throughout the playoffs. Um, just based on his great defense and the fact that with a 123 WRC plus, he was much more productive during the regular season. Uh, arbitration number up over $7 million, so he's starting to get expensive. Uh, given his durability and his excellent defense, we'll probably bring him back, although that number is getting relatively rich. Uh, Walt Miller hit just 226 for us, uh, had 11 homers and 323 at-bats, uh, but was a little below average offensively. Uh, still two-plus wins above replacement level for us. Good, solid catcher. He is headed to arbitration where he's expected to make in the neighborhood of $3 million. So um, these guys are getting more expensive but still think that $10 million for the two of them who are both above average defensively and in Medina's case, uh, borderline excellent defensively, who combined hit 21 homers this past season uh, in 2036-37 and quite honestly in 2023 baseball economics, uh, $10 million for this duo probably is still a reasonable uh, deal. Arturo Flores, uh, still considered a prospect, the number 97 prospect in baseball, but he spent the whole year with the big club, uh, hit just 244 with nine homers and 266 at-bats. So he wasn't incredible. Uh, he doesn't have anything left to prove in the minors, uh, but his WRC plus was below average and only a bit above replacement level. Looking at his profile, uh, still has well above average home run power and slightly above average contact and eye. So I think he should be a relatively productive player for us. I like that he's a captain personality. He's a first baseman slash DH. Um, Definitely a guy that we prefer to start against left-handed pitching, and if we have to play him against right-handed pitching once in a while, it's not the end of the world. Uh, he'll be back with us next year. The question is how big his role is, and when we ultimately finish up by talking about Shamar Jenneret and what we might do with him, that will go a long way towards uh, helping determine how many at-bats Flores will be getting for us and where those at-bats might be coming from next year. Mike Heiner, another first baseman, picked him 32nd overall out of Bradley in 2032. Uh, he, I guess you have to say his first or his first two years in the majors were better than his last two years in the majors. He hit over 300 each of those first two years. Uh, this year he hit 266, 19 homers, still drove in 91 runs, 12 out of 14 on the base paths, but not quite as... Uh, prodigious in terms of uh, how often he's running this year compared to previous seasons, was still an above-average offensive player. He's a guy who we signed to an extension before he ever played a major league game, so we're not going to be paying crazy money for him these next few years, uh, but certainly we're hoping that he might be 
a kind of 115, 120 WRC plus kind of player uh, for us regularly, which he hasn't been for two seasons now. Uh, hopefully we'll get a bit more production out of him going forward, but still a guy that is likely to be back with us next year. And speaking of former first round draft picks, uh, Deshaun Seifu is a former number one overall pick uh, who had another fantastic year for us now. He has led the National League in steals nine consecutive years, regularly leads the National League in at-bats, runs, hits, doubles, and or triples, and he won a batting title a year ago. Uh, he's won a little bit of postseason hardware at this point. Obviously, the championships with us two of the last three years. A couple gold gloves when he was younger, a couple silver sluggers more recently. Uh, four time All Star. Feel like he hasn't gotten the uh, credit he deserves in terms of awards. Uh, a couple years ago, he finished second in the voting for MVP. Uh, I think he's likely to finish second or third this year, although I'd love to see Deshaun Seifu win an MVP award. He has been an incredibly productive player for us. He's a guy, as I mentioned, we pick number one overall. A second baseman slash third baseman at this point out of Fordham. He is uh, almost certainly the best Fordham player since uh, Frankie Frisch a century before him. Love the Iron Man injury proneness. Uh, to this point, his speed has held up very well. Uh, still a very good contact hitter with outstanding gap power to generate all those extra base hits. The question is, um, can we afford to bring him back? And if so, how much should we pay him? And how many years should we pay him for? He's looking for seven years at almost $27 million a year. Uh, no trade clause, player option for the final season. Uh, with where we are financially at this point, with about $29 million to $31 million, actually $31 uh, million available, we can certainly afford to bring him back if we want to. Um, and my inclination is to bring him back, but I hear what some of you most vociferously three-quarters badger have been saying recently that uh, speed will deteriorate early and quickly hasn't happened with Seifu yet but it certainly could and if and when that speed starts to deteriorate um, even if the gap power is maintained it's less useful if his speed is 60 or lower um, so going to be an interesting decision. I tend to think I'm going to try to bring him back just because it would be kind of cool to have a number one overall pick that we have on our team and follow throughout an entire career, ultimately see whether he makes it into the Hall of Fame or not. Um, I think in terms of the hardware he's won, he's not quite Hall of Fame pace, but He's 32 years old, and barring injury, he's going to get his 2,000th hit probably July or August of next season. That leaves him as a guy who probably is 33 years old, who's 1,000 hits away from 3,000, and he's led the NL in hits five times. If he stays healthy and if he maintains some degree of his speed, He's got an outside chance at 3,000 hits, and he also likely uh, will end up with over 1,000 steals and probably trail only Ricky Henderson. And if you're a 3,000 hit guy with 1,000 steals and a career batting average that'll likely be in the 290s when all is said and done, uh, feels like you're probably a Hall of Famer to me. But we will find out uh, those answers probably in another 12 to 15 seasons of uh, OOTP. Joe Edwards was our third baseman much of this year. Uh, he is finally arbitration eligible, and he's going from making the major league minimum to making four and a half, five million. 
Uh, a guy who was once one of the top prospects in our system, former second round pick, um, got the most playing time that he's ever got this season. And with that great eye he has, he led the National League with 104 walks, um, 255 average, 24 homers, 127 WRC plus, 4.2 war, the best number of his career, obviously helped by the most playing time in his career. He is a good, solid player. I like his positional versatility, even though this year we've had him basically as a third baseman. At four and a half, five million dollars, certainly we'll have him back next year in his first arbitration eligible season. I do feel like his price is probably going to get too high for me at some point over the next few years, but we will uh, deal with that when the time comes and then i like our young platoon at shortstop although it's really not so young with tim hull anymore uh steve anderson the left-handed hitter gets more playing time hit 258 this year 30 doubles 15 homers uh 95 wrc plus so a little below average offensively uh, but for a guy who has a solid glove at shortstop not a great glove but a solid glove at shortstop um pretty useful player for us and uh, he's still going to be making the major league minimum next year so a uh, good bargain for us as well tim hall was a third round pick a decade ago who had been our starting shortstop before anderson came up uh, now hull is our starter the last couple of years just against left-handed pitching at shortstop but has the ability to play all over the infield so a um platoon shortstop but also a uh, potential super utility guy who we can play all over the field if and when we have injuries hit just 213 this year uh, so didn't seem to take very well to the uh, lower use this year compared to the way he almost thrived in that uh, position a year ago 62 wrc plus uh, easily the worst of his career was below replacement level Looking at his position versatility, looking at his um, infield ratings, not the fastest guy in the world, but not horrible on the base paths, and a hitting profile that is still respectable. Um, we kind of signed him to a deal uh, that views him as a utility infielder who can start for us in a pinch. $6 million is certainly getting, I think, pretty close to full value for him. But I do like the versatility he brings, so would have to think that he'll be back with us next year. So it's conceivable that uh, the six kind of uh, infielders for us next year and the two catchers are all exactly the same. Alejandro Mercado, former Rule 5 pick, um, spent most of this year in Albany. He's been in the minors most of the last couple years uh, trying to learn how to play all over the infield. Uh, I don't think the bat will ever allow him to be an everyday player on a good team, but think that he could be a useful utility infielder uh, for us next year. Still his one option year left, uh, so barring some changes, uh, we'll probably get caught in a numbers game and end up at AAA. Uh, but if we have some injuries, a versatile infielder like him who uh, can at least not be horrible with the bat is a useful thing to have in the system. So as I've talked about, if we do decide to make an offer to Seifu to bring him back, uh, catching an infield look real similar. But the outfield, we likely have some big changes coming. Uh, the one guy we know who will be back is likely Bobby Bolig. Had a down year this year, 275 with 18 homers and 476 at-bats. Did have 35 doubles, uh, but the 120 WRC plus that he put up for us uh, was the second worst figure of his uh, tenure with us and the second worst figure of his career. Another guy who we signed to an extension, and the money is starting to get a bit high uh, for the production we got from Bolig this year. Looking at his batting ratings, uh, it's a little bit concerning. He still remains a very good uh, and useful player on the base paths, which is positive. 
And the fortunate thing about Bowleg is that his ratings against right-handed pitchers are much better than against left-handed pitchers. So even if he is only a platoon player to hopefully maximize his uh, production, you're going to be getting to play him in a platoon 120, 130, maybe even 135 or 40 games a season, depending on how the matchups work out. So I um, still like him. But as I said, um, with the bump to $15 million next year, he is a fully valued player and perhaps overvalued if he plays the way he played this year. If he puts up a 140 WRC plus like he did a year ago, then um, I think we still get pretty good value out of him. But a um, guy who I thought we would be building around for the long, long term, I could see a scenario over the next couple of years where we try to get out of that contract. Tim Gaglia, a uh, young center fielder, very good defensively, was league average in terms of his offense with a 100 WRC plus, uh, 266 average, six homers, and 256 at bats. Uh, has some speed, was 10 of 12 on the base paths. A useful player, uh, but not a great player. I think the same description applies to Tyree Cartage. Uh, another 26-year-old center fielder. He was uh, below average offensively for us, as he's been most of his career. Does have pretty good outfield range, does have some speed. He was 9 out of 10 on the base paths. A little more home run pop with 10 homers and 297 at-bats. You know, in a perfect world, on a perfect team, I think Hardage and Gaglia are both 4th and 5th outfielders. Uh, for us... They're probably starting center fielders in some combination next year. Speaking of starting center fielders, uh, we have James Wood, who was our center fielder against right-handers this year. And bringing him back after his uh, brutal season for us a year ago was controversial with many of you. It was controversial with me, quite honestly. Um, he was league average production offensively this year with a 100 WRC plus, but he was definitely better than he was a year ago. Uh, 17 homers and 320 at bats. Uh, did not run quite as much, uh, but still put up a 1.3 WAR. And as we talked about in our last episode, uh, he did really come through for us in the postseason this year. Um, the 286 batting average is not incredible. Uh, but the seven home runs in 49 at-bats with 10 runs scored and 10 runs driven in is uh, not necessarily incredible, but pretty darn productive. And that 184 WRC plus that he put up through the playoffs along with those seven home runs certainly was a big contribution to what we were able to achieve this uh, past postseason. Uh, that said, we've got an option for Wood for this upcoming year at $4 million. He's fragile. He's 34 years old. Uh, and he's had three consecutive years in the majors now where at best he's been an average offensive player. So given that we have uh, Bolig almost certainly coming back and the youngsters gaggly and hardage around, we could consider moving on from Mr. Wood. And the last two outfielder-ish players to talk about are probably two of the most interesting because their futures with us are probably linked. One is Joe Gallagher, the number eight prospect in baseball, a guy who... Uh, had incredible development for us from a ninth round pick just two years ago in 2034 out of central Missouri uh, to become one of the top prospects in baseball. And he has had some monster seasons for us uh, over the course of his career. Uh, in 2035, uh, we've talked about this before through four levels 
of our minor league system. Uh, all he did was hit 74 home runs. And this past season, between Albany and the Majors, he hit 64 home runs, uh, 167 WRC plus with five homers and 12 ribbies and 53 at bats when he finally did make his major league debut for us in September. Ended up putting him on the postseason roster. Uh, certainly looks like he could be an absolutely awesome home run hitter. Doesn't bring anything to the table defensively or in terms of his personality or on the base paths. But a young player who, while we still think he has more potential than he's shown in terms of his abilities so far, doesn't have anything at all left to prove in the minors. And uh, certainly looks like he should be a strong candidate for a DH slash first base slash corner outfield role with us next season. But right now, that DH role is manned by Shamar Jenneret, who we signed to a massive seven-year contract three years ago. Uh, the big news with Jenneret is uh, he has opted out of the final four years of that contract. So he is heading to free agency. He has the best batting profile of anyone on our team. He's looking for seven years at close to $40 million a year. He was making the close to $40 million a year for us uh, with the last four years of this contract. So he's just really looking for another $120 million or so in another three years or so in terms of guarantees. So the fact that he has opted out of that contract is what puts us in a position to have around $30 million available and to be able to be in a position where we can think about resigning a Carrillo or a Veliz or more likely a Seifu. But potentially moving on from Generet will be dangerous for our team. Since we had made the playoffs six consecutive seasons before Mr. Generet joined us, and we never made it past the National League Championship Series. While we have had Mr. Generet on the team, we've made the playoffs three more times. We've won two World Series championships, and we have won seven of the eight playoff series that we have competed in with Mr. Generet. The lone loss coming in seven games in the NLCS to the Rockies a season ago. So he has proven to be the missing piece in our offense. And as we talked about earlier, we were sixth this year in home runs, taking his productive bat, which led our team with 36 homers out of the lineup, probably moves us from a slightly above average team in terms of homers to a below average team in terms of home run power. But I do feel like with the young guys like Arturo Flores and Joe Gallagher around who we would prefer not to be playing in the field. Moving on from a DH Generat who's in his 30s, will be 32 on Christmas Day, and is looking for a lot of money and a lot of years, is probably the right decision. So right now, I think I'm more inclined to try to bring Seifu back than to bring Jenneret back. But before we make that decision, we do need to look at what Jenneret did this year. And all he did was hit 131 ribbies, uh, leading the National League for a third consecutive season and leading the league that he played in for a fourth consecutive season. His 138 WRC plus uh, was the worst that he's put up for us. But I would argue that it's not hyperbole for me to say that Shamar Jenneret could be the greatest free agent signing in certainly Buffalo Wings history. 
but you could argue that he's the greatest free agent signing in the history of Major League Baseball. Think about what happened in the three years that he was with the Buffalo Wings. 2034, he joined us. He leads the league in ribbies. And he is named the World Series MVP. 2035, his second year with us. He leads the league in ribbies again. And he is named the National League MVP joining only one player, Frank Robinson, as the two guys who have won most valuable player awards in both the American League and the National League. And then this year, his third season with us, he leads the league and runs batted in for a third consecutive season. And is named World Series MVP once again. So three years, two world championships, a 7-1 record in playoff series, led the league in ribbies three consecutive years, two World Series MVPs, and a National League MVP. Um, he has been the piece that we needed and the piece that was missing to get this team over the top. Because um, as I talked about, we had six consecutive seasons where we were always, well, not always, but we were usually um, a very good team. But we could never get past the LCS in the playoffs. Generette came along and uh, the LCS is the worst that we've done. So with the fact that if he did leave us now, we basically just got three seasons out of him right in the prime of his career, a couple of world championships, and some incredible individual honors for him. Um, it's going to leave a huge hole in the lineup if we move on from him. But with the likes of Flores and Gallagher, feel like we've got guys who could fill that DH role. They're not going to put up the numbers that Jenneret has. But they're going to do it for a lot less money. Um, so right now, I think my inclination is to spend the money freed up by Jenneret opting out of his contract on trying to bring Seifu back for probably fewer years, probably less money, and probably more optionality for our team than he's looking for right now. But I think my inclination is to make an offer to Seifu and maybe try to get him signed even before uh, he hits free agency. And then we've still got three option year decisions that are in our hands that we need to think about and make. And I've touched on each of these already throughout the episode. Um, Hayden Yinger at $1.6 million. I think I'm inclined to bring him back. Harleen Susana at $10 million. I think I'm inclined to let him go. James Wood at $4 million is a little bit more of a toss-up. But I think I am inclined to potentially move on from him also. Because if I do decline Wood and Susana at about $14 million... Um, That puts our money for extensions up to around the $45 million range, which means we do have an opportunity to not just potentially bring back Seifu, but if we wanted to bring back Jorge Carrillo, um, we could do that. As I talked about, I like the great personality, like that he's going to be out there every fifth day. And he has been a good but not great pitcher for us. Um, 112 ERA plus, 91 FIP minus, 
putting up a two and a half to three and a half war these last three years when he's been an everyday starting pitcher for us. Honestly, close to a four war that first year when he won 21 games. I mean, he's won 52 games in lost 14 over the last three years. Um, he's been the winningest pitcher on our pitching staff. Now that's a lot of luck involved. But I think if you're going to spend 15-ish million dollars, I'm probably more inclined to spend it on a 31-year-old Carrillo who's an Iron Man than to spend that money combined on a 33-year-old Harleen Susana plus a soon-to-be 35-year-old fragile James Wood. Um, or I could let Susanna and her Wood go and not try to sign Carrillo and uh, use that money for something else. And then there's always an option of uh, pulling some money out of scouting and development um, and trying to do something crazy, bring back multiple players. But honestly, if you do move on from Carrillo in particular, plus, uh, or Su Susanna in particular, plus Woods, and we don't try to sign Carrillo, all of a sudden we've got the money to... Um, bring back Jenneret if we want to move on from Seifu. So that's another option that I think we at least need to consider since, as we've talked about, Jenneret has absolutely been the missing link in terms of getting this team over the hump and to become world champions. Um, so we've got some interesting decisions to make. I know some of you have been sharing thoughts uh, since the playoff episode with me on what we should do. Maybe this uh, deep dive that we've just completed now into how everyone actually performed this year and what I'm thinking has uh, changed your thoughts or made you um, feel like you're armed with the knowledge of how these players look in terms of their rankings and their performance that you, you feel more comfortable making a recommendation. So if you've got thoughts on what we should do, would love to hear them. Right now, if I were to make a decision and just start playing the game, I would make an offer to Seifu. I would, I am going to extend Hayden Yinger. Um, at 1.6 million we're going to execute the option and bring him back so that one's not up to a decision for me i'm inclined to move on from susanna at 10 million and a little less sure about what to do with james wood at 4 million so if you've got thoughts on susanna and wood that you haven't shared would love to hear them and then assuming that i move on from one or both of them um the other decision, assuming that I do make an offer to Seifu, is whether we try to bring Carrillo back or given that we've locked up Estrada and Chazier for many years to come and we're going to need some money next year to hopefully lock up Barajas for the long term. Is Carrillo the guy that we decide to move on from um, to ensure that we'll have money to bring Barajas back on a long-term deal? Or do we sign Carrillo now and uh, figure out we'll find money for Barajas somehow if we need to next offseason if we haven't signed him before then? So if you've got thoughts on where we should go and what we should do, please share them. Otherwise, in our next episode, uh, we'll take a look at our farm system in a little more depth, check in on some former top prospects from other teams, some guys that we drafted in the past and moved on from, 
and some of our former players who were big parts of Buffalo years ago who have moved on to other major league teams. And then after we do that, we're going to have to start making some decisions around uh, all of these questions that I've posed, plus some more questions. So again, if you've got thoughts, please share them. And until our next episode, thanks so much for watching and hope you have a great day.